Hey, all right. Ethereum is up over 30% in the past seven days. The worst of the crypto contagion appears to be behind us. Oh, we'll have part two of our discussion on DeFi versus CeFi, the future of banking with our special guest, Rob Leshner, the founder of Compound. Looking forward to that. All this and our AAA, Ask Abra Anything. All right, it's time for Money Talks. All right, let's get to this. Uh, as, as I told you last week, the macro story is clearly driving crypto. There's no doubt about it. But as I also theorized, uh, you know, Ethereum and the merge news would likely lead to crypto markets up or down. Well, so far it's up. Let's jump right in. So I've got my Ethereum chart here ready to go. I'm not really that interested in short term trading price predictions. I do want to use this as a moment just to dig in on what's likely going on from a macro perspective. We're going to have Rao Paul on the show next week. I'm super excited about it. He's going to get into why money supply seems to be the deciding factor uh, determining the price for risk on assets and crypto being no exception. If not only is it not the exception, it seems to be more of an extreme case of that, just given the exponential growth in the asset class over the past 10 years. But as you can see here from the, the weekly charts, right, we clearly bounced off the lows. This was kind of intraday. It says intro week here, but it was really almost intraday. So uh, if you are a short-term trader and you bought in at a thousand, you're very happy right now because Ethereum is sitting right, right under 1600. And it was at 1600 when I was uh, up early, early this morning. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think, yeah, 1640 ish was the, the intraday high. Uh, and it, it has been moving around a lot intraday. It's down half a percent. It's pulled back a lot in the last hour or so. But as I said, right now, the short-term trend appears to be uh, news-driven based on the merge, and that is moving Ethereum at a rapid clip versus Bitcoin. And as you can see here, this is the weekly. Let me switch to, oh, this is the daily. So um, as you can see here, uh, Bitcoin bounced off the channel my long-term channel at around 18,000 and is now at right around 23,000. So, you know, up, uh, what, what's that? Uh, 30%. Yes. Yeah, so similar to, similar to, uh, to Ethereum, not quite as much, but, but still, uh, pretty impressive. So clearly, uh, we've broken through this short-term range. Again, it's news driven, I think via Ethereum. So the big question is, is the macro situation, going to change. And that is largely going to be a function of expectations. In other words, uh, do we believe that the credit tightening is going to ease based upon fears of an imminent recession? I think we've got a few, couple of more months, as I said, of uh, tightening. And then uh, the uh, ISM is going to collapse, which Raul is going to get into with us next week. He's, he's a, the master at explaining this. And then I think after that, uh, it's going to be game on. Uh, as I mentioned to you last week as well, uh, go follow Arthur Hayes. He's done a masterful job of outlining the international impact of all of this, in particular Europe and Japan, whose economies may very well completely collapse if the US does not change their stance, okay? So I don't have a lot more to say on charts uh, in the short term other than uh, like I said, we'll see what happens. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, two things happen at the same time. One, we do get uh, kind of a, a, a macro squeeze, which pushes the markets higher based upon expectations of credit easing. But we could be coming out of the merge, which could give us a sell the news situation at the same time. So those two could counteract, counteract each other. But I do think right now, uh, the the tailwinds here are stronger than the headwinds, and this could bode very, very well for a second half rally for crypto. All right. Uh, if nothing goes straight up, I don't, I'm not here to give investment advice or predictions. I just kind of read the tea leaves. Um, and, and the longer term, uh, further out I can go, the more accurate the tea leaves seem to get. All right. So 
Let's get into a little bit of news. Uh, first of all, uh, go check out Frank Shapiro's latest episode of The Scoop. Uh, Frank and I spent about an hour talking about all things crypto lending, why Abra came out smelling like roses versus a lot of our competitors who are no longer with us. We talked about risk management, some of the things that I've talked about with you many times. And yeah, so we get into it in a lot of detail and having him ask questions versus just be pontificating is definitely a better, better format for this topic. And so check it out. Uh, I haven't listened to it. I'm not going to listen to it. I don't like listening to myself. I leave that to you. But um, but yeah, I think uh, I think it's worth a listen. So thanks, Frank, for asking me to come on. Uh, I think the timing was very good. Now, speaking of the nuts from Three Arrows, they broke their silence this morning. Big, big article in Bloomberg. I don't know why they agreed to do this because they did not help themselves. They talked about the losses. Uh, they, they, they basically deflected. It was incredible. Either these guys are dumb, uh, they're, they're naive, or they don't care, or some combination of the three, but they did not do themselves any favors with this long article. Here's the, um, the Internet Archive version of it. Uh, but if you're a Bloomberg subscriber, you can check it out. Uh, really long article. I, I don't like Bloomberg's style of not giving complete quotes because it allows reporters to take things out of context, which they've been known to do on occasion. But uh, I think based on my knowledge of what's happening, they get it mostly right. Nevertheless, I wish they would just basically put the raw, um, you know, the raw quotes up there somewhere so we could basically not have to worry about context. But independent of that, I think it's definitely a great read. And, um, you know, some of these comments here, like, in response to questions about what went wrong at the firm, Zhu cited overconfidence born of a multi-year bull market that infused not just him and Davies, but nearly all of the industry's credit infrastructure where lenders saw their values swell. And then he said there was always an understanding of what they were do getting themselves into. Well, that's a bunch of nonsense because my belief in what I've seen is, is there's a whole lot of fraud here in terms of what they were disclosing to these lending firms. So, so the level of of deflection uh, and and just lack of mea culpa. If you're even going to talk to the press, I'm not even sure what the upside is and why their lawyers would tell them that there's a good good reason for them to be talking to the press at this point. But but um, besides the entertainment value, it's it's kind of insane. And check it out. All right, Tesla was in the news. They sold about a billion dollars uh, worth of Bitcoin last quarter. Uh, Bitcoin fell in the news, but. Uh, because it was already done and because Musk said it was really more of a cash crunch uh, for Tesla, given the supply chain concerns coming out of um, out of China in particular uh, and, and the fact that they would be willing at some point to boosting their Bitcoin exposure in the future. Uh, and he explicitly said, and I think the quote is I have it here, this should not be taken as some verdict on Bitcoin. It's kind of sad to me that we're still even talking about Musk and I have to do it because the market is doing it. Uh, but we still are, and I hope that at some point soon, uh, nobody will care. There's a site that uh, tracks uh, Bitcoin treasuries. Uh, it hasn't been updated in a while, so I didn't tweet it. I tweeted it last year, and it, it was probably my most retweeted tweet of the year. And basically, it shows all of the companies, public, private, funds, et cetera, et cetera, that hold Bitcoin on their balance sheets. Okay. Um, Okay, so so left of that and other news, fantastic uh, opinion piece on CoinDesk by our friend Nick Carter. Uh, Nick and I have been going back and forth trying to get him on Money Talks. It may not happen before my vacation, uh, maybe the week after we have Raul on, but I was hoping to get him before that because it's so timely. Anyway, what, what Nick does here is he gives a great short-term history of credit, uh, lessons learned from prior credit crises, how uh, Bitcoin maximalists get it wrong uh, by railing against credit, his defense of the idea of credit uh, and opacity that's required to do this right and why DeFi is so interesting. And of course, we're going to get into that in a few minutes with Rob Leshner coming on. And uh, again, check it out. It's, uh, I've, I've tweeted it. So if you're following me on Twitter, you can see it. Uh, yesterday, I retweeted it and you should check it out. I've also been spending a fair amount of time digging into USDC lately. 
Uh, I've spoken to uh, Jeremy uh, Allaire directly, asked him a bunch of questions about their risk processes, came away very impressed. I think uh, he has a fantastic understanding of what's going on. His CFO, uh, Jeremy Fox Green, also seems to be very strong. So as a company that had a lot of stops and starts, and so have we, honestly, in the crypto space, they really seem to have found a huge niche for themselves. Uh, I think the focus is fantastic. And I think Jeremy has the right temperament to run a project like this. This is not a DeFi project, right? I mean, if you're holding dollars on behalf of other people, you're effectively running a bank. My prediction is, is that Circle will eventually become a bank. I, don't, I, I did not discuss that with him, but, but that's, my, that's my prediction. Okay. All right. So uh, bullish on Circle and my bullishness uh, for USDC uh, continues to grow. Lastly, in the, in the news this week, uh, really interesting the SEC sued uh, or, or, or proce is prosecuting uh, a former employee of Coinbase for insider trading. Now, not only is this interesting because Coinbase claims that they're the ones that reported both the former employee as well as the other people involved in the insider trading to the authorities. In the SEC's case, they actually claim that some of the crypto assets by definition, were securities because the SEC cannot bring insider trading cases against people trading assets uh, that aren't securities. Now, the CFTC does have authority, according to them, to bring insider trading cases uh, against people for trading commodities, but they beat the CFTC to the punch on this. As a result, Carolyn Pham, a CFTC uh, commissioner, for those of you not familiar, the CFTC in the United States, Commodities Futures Trading Commission regulates the trading of derivatives on commodities. Many of you in other countries, you have a single regulator for both commodities and securities. In the US, we separate the two. The trading of spot price-based uh, transactions for commodities is unregulated in the US, but the trading of derivatives is regulated. When I say unregulated, uh, that's true in terms of just normal operation. But if you're breaking laws around insider trading on spot transactions, they do have oversight authority and do have the right to work with the Department of Justice to bring criminal charges against uh, perp perpetrators. So interesting here comments that she says the case of the SEC versus uh, Wahi is a striking example of regulation by enforcement. By, by basically alleging that dozens of crypto assets, digital assets, including those that could be described as utility tokens and or tokens relating to decentralized uh, autonomous organizations or DAOs are securities. Seems like she gets it. So we'll see how this plays out. I think this is not going to end well for the SEC because of the way they structured this case. Could it end up back in the hands of the CFTC again, which actually makes more sense to me. Okay, so let's see. I think we'll stop there in terms of news for today. All right, so I know we're gonna get Rob on in a few minutes. I know he's traveling. So while he's getting set up, we're gonna do our uh, AAA for the day. So uh, let's bring on, uh, let's see, Deepak Tanner, are you guys here with us today? I think you are. All right, good morning, guys. How's it going? Good, how are you, Bill? morning doing good you know it's a light news week so you know my my hair is no more gray than it was uh last week uh, <laughs> and and so i don't know why i always go with the hair theme with you guys so sorry uh but uh but yeah i'm good i'm good it's like um no news is good news right now and and so uh at least the um what do you call it the the, the merge news uh was the the, the bout of of good news and uh, i got yeah, my, I gonna... my abra hoodie yeah. on guys can see it so I'm, I'm i'm good to go so um, for a no news week there was still a pretty intense news especially the 3ac one which is at least had the entertainment value but yeah. for a no news week in crypto was pretty newsy right uh, right <laughs> right it's like it's like it's not new news but it's building on right i have to roll my eyes to figure out how to explain myself on that one but it's like building on all the nonsense <laughs> that we already knew about so <laughs> anyway so what's top of mind guys what's going on um, well, I can maybe I can take a stab at it. So um, I mean, uh, we we launched uh, each two um, staking uh, Ethereum um, less than two weeks ago, mm -hmm. and uh, we're already seeing uh, nearly a million uh, uh, USD worth of each two already staked, uh, which is fantastic and it's growing oh, by the day. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's, it's fantastic. Um, and uh, so that's great. Even in a bear market, we are seeing bullishness, at least within the Abra's ecosystem, which is fantastic. And we just made it so easy uh, to stake ETH that, you know, it just makes, uh, you know, all the sense in the world to do so. Yeah. Um, so that, that's... Let me, let me make one comment on that to, the, to, to everyone. So, you know, at Abra, we don't have a marketing budget. And not in the sense of like, you know, you're not going to see us doing billboards in Times Square, you know, ETH2 staking is live or, you know, buses in Manhattan or in San Francisco or, you know, hire Matt Damon to do Super Bowl commercials, at least not now. And, <laughs> and as a result, when these features get traction, it's either word of mouth, uh, very simple, you know, CRM or, or email activities from the team or social media, you all retweeting. And so that's a big deal for us. And, and so while we do have a strong balance sheet, we have a lot of cash, we've chosen not to spend it on silly marketing activities and be a very product centric company. Now we will start investing more in marketing over the next year, but I just wanted to make the point that as these features gain traction, it really is organic. It's because you all wanted this and you figured it out and that's, that's awesome. Yeah, it's fantastic. That is fantastic. Um, um, yeah, so that was, the, that was the big news that I wanted to share. Um, and other than that, that, we did talk about adding um, uh, a lot more like, international uh, payment methods. Uh, in the last I'm getting a little bit of feedback, Deepak. I don't know if it's, if it's me or you. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I'm still getting feedback. Are we getting... Yeah, we're hearing okay. it. So, um, so I don't know why yeah, I'm yeah. Okay. Why don't you mute? All right. So Tanner, what's going on in your world? Uh, standing by helping folks. Uh, lots of questions around ETH2, what the differences are, things of that nature. Um, definitely. I think in terms of uh, staking, it's, it's a little bit different than what you might be used to in the yeah. earned product. Uh, the big difference is uh, the liquidity piece of it. So just make sure that you understand. Uh, yeah. When you, when you choose to stake ETH2, uh, you're not gonna have immediate access to the funds until the merge is complete. Uh, and shortly after, uh, then, then we'll uh, make sure that we're communicating with our users there. Um, I would say that's probably the biggest thing- This is thing not up to Abra, to be clear, right? So, so when, when the funds get unlocked is, is really up to you know, the, the Ethereum code and, and not up to Abra. So you are locking up your crypto the the biggest difference is that you're getting a a kind of a risk free return versus a lending based return at the same time spot on yeah that's that's an important distinction to make uh for sure um so thanks thanks for adding that clarity sure um thing. but yeah other than that we're uh we're standing by happy to help anything and everything that uh folks need um we're here yeah. so yeah we've definitely seen uh, a, a significant increase in in deposits again uh, I would say today I'm looking at the counter. Today is the 22nd, so I would say since the 15th or so, we've clearly seen a turnaround where where people are getting comfortable again. I don't know if it was co coinciding with the, the 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 merge news and 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 the rise in, in Ethereum prices leading the market higher, but but all in all, uh, we've definitely seen a, a, a turnaround on on that front. Um, people asking for a C perks update. I'll 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 take that one. Um, there's no. No news since last week. Uh, we continue to make fent. I saw an update yesterday from the, the credit card team, and it's it's just awesome. Um, and uh, it's it's really going to be cool. It's it's going to leverage C perks. We've got a bunch of other uh, products that we've been talking about nonstop around trading and other things that are also eventually going to leverage C perks. Somebody's asking about how the four uh, percent uh, interest is paid. Uh, you want to take that, uh, Deepak Tanner? Is the four percent added weekly in kind, or is it is it paid differently? Um, any any comment there on how the ETH staking interest works? Good question. It it, it is paid differently. Um, it uh, instead of being added weekly in kind, like you might be used to, um, it's it's basically accruing in terms of APR instead of APY, and will be paid out uh, following the merge. Yeah, and it doesn't really affect you directly since you can't withdraw the funds anyway so you're not going to see the, the the balance go up until the funds are credited so I'm seeing a couple of questions on the idea of staking i have spoken about eth staking a couple of shows in the past you can go back and watch but just at a very high level 
what we're talking about here with ETH2 staking is the idea of replacing uh, proof of work with proof of stake. Proof of work uses uh, gamification across multiple uh, miners to basically determine how to distribute new tokens and also how to process pending transactions. Proof of stake basically asks people to put skin in the, skin in the game for the right to become validators of transactions for which they receive additional tokens as payments. And so there's a lot of debates over which one is more decentralized. Clearly, there's no debate over which one uses less electricity. Clearly, proof of stake uses almost like 85, 90% less, if not more, uh, electricity than proof of work. And uh, like I said, I've done a few explanations of this in detail. I think I did a pretty detailed one two weeks ago on the show. All right. Um, still getting questions about C Perks. I just answered it. I'm going to hold off on any more C Perks questions. We're all in on C Perks. I'm really excited about where it's going. Um, I'm repeating myself. So I'm going to get on to more interesting things. Can, um, can, I think we've basically turned off Hawaii for the short term. Uh, and so if any of you have questions about Hawaii and you're an existing Abra user, uh, then you can contact Tanner's team via the support channel in the app. I believe that's right. Um, somebody asking who won, who won the, golf, the Abra golf outing? You know, I didn't make it. I, I was supposed to be there and I'm so busy with all of this nonsense going on in the lending markets that I, I really had to stay uh, in the office. And so I couldn't make it down to LA for, uh, for the golf outing. So, so maybe they'll, uh, I know there were some celebrities there, some NFL folks that are, that are average users. I know everybody had a great time that was able to make it. And um, I apologize that I couldn't make it, but uh, right now uh, my priorities are, are very, very clear. So I wasn't able to leave the office. Um, so Deepak, are you back or are you still, uh, Oh, I don't know if he's there or not. Are you are you back? Are you able to give us a, a broader update before before Rob joins? Uh, was that sorry? I I missed. Uh, I oh missed yeah, I was just asking if yeah, your your audio is back. That's good. So so tell us what else is going on. We 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 covered we covered staking. What else is top of mind? Uh, yeah, no, I was just going to talk about the payment methods that we uh, talked about, uh, I, I think, in the last two sessions. But we did add a bunch of uh, new payment methods for our national users. Uh, we added support for SEPA and uh, so forth. These are payment methods used in the EU yep. primarily, uh, Interact in Canada, Poly, Australia, New Zealand, Ideal, Netherlands. So uh, a bunch of different payment methods added. Uh, and uh, a subtle uh, new feature that we added uh, when you go to buy crypto uh, using one of our fiat to crypto on ramps is that it's going to be a lot more intelligent now. So if you if you go through the same process um, now, it's going to actually recommend to you uh, which vendor uh, should you use based on the asset that you're trying to purchase and based on your previous buying uh, behaviors. Um, which is which is great. So um, those are those are some of the kind of like kayak, but for crypto, right? That's right. That's right. Exactly. If it's global or if it's just a U.S. thing, but kayak is a travel comparison shopping engine, which tells you which flights are the cheapest for what you're trying to do, right? That's right. That's right. So that's exactly the concept that we have with the with what we call marketplace, where you have multiple vendors basically competing uh, against each other for your business. And we are the aggregator that sits in between and has all the data in the world to tell you which one is the best for you and we will float yep. them up. Um, so we become a good recommendations engine there. <clears throat> By the way, I was talking about uh, the Amex project and the fact that I, I saw the update from the team yesterday and uh, how, how, how we're making fantastic progress. And that's sure if you guys saw that uh, American Express was in the news uh, today, they, 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 they crushed it last quarter, raised guidance. And um, yeah, and that's he, interesting. Yeah. He, he doesn't agree with Raul on his, his recession fears. And, and he mm -hmm. says they're, you know, obviously they're very travel centric and, and travel's clearly back right now. Travel tends to be a, a trailing indicator uh, just because of the way it's reported. So, so, but it was pretty cool to see them. Uh, they did mention uh, the project with Abra uh, in, mm -hmm. in his um, analyst interview, uh, you know, very, they're very bullish on it. So I thought that was pretty cool. Very and cool. Uh, yeah, so, so we're really excited. And, and obviously 
uh, they're excited as well. And this is clearly their, their short-term crypto bet. And uh, hopefully it's the first of many for the company. But congrats to the team there on, on, a, on a killer quarter. I mean, they're, they're actually leading the Dow higher today, so which, is, which is pretty fun uh, to see. So. Very cool. Yeah. All right. So what else? What else do we talk about? Um, I can probably add one more. I mean, right. our team, our team is in fire. Um, so um, th again, uh, uh, um, it only applies to the subset of users. But if you are a US user um, and uh, you are used to ACHing funds into Abra, um, then uh, you're gonna you're gonna see only a thirty day hold uh, on your funds. Uh, so let me let me explain just really quick. When you bring your funds in, you're able to trade instantly on Abra. So that's okay. But previously, you weren't able to withdraw those funds for 60 days. Um, if you wanted to transfer uh, those funds out of Abra, you wouldn't be able to do it for 60 days because of fraud reasons. Um, uh, we we had a you know relatively long period of hold uh, because you might get into sort of um, you know chargeback situations and and all kinds of fraud things that might happen on the back end. So in order to prevent um, those situations, we used to have a 60 day hold, um, but uh, we recently upgraded our risk infrastructure so it has become a little bit more intelligent. And that allows us to bring the whole period down to 30 days, which is great for you as a awesome. user. You bring the funds in and, um, you know, if you want to withdraw, you can do it um, uh, within in 30 days. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. And this may not be clear to users that uh, that the merchant in this case, you know, Abra or our counterparties actually has chargeback risk on an ACH transaction, similar to how a credit card transaction works. So most consumers in most countries, if you're using credit, not debit, have the right to reverse a credit card transaction. However, if you use your bank for a person-to-person -person transfer in most countries, you don't have chargeback rights. In the US, you do. And, and you actually have, I believe it's 90 days of chargeback rights, which is pure insanity. That's right, yeah. It basically yeah. allows the consumer to more or less buy anything they want and claim ignorance and, and get their money back. And how, how the system doesn't break under the weight of that is, is beyond me, but but those are the rights. And, and so not saying that all of you would do that, but I'm just saying that the rights for you to do that are there. Uh, and, and, and clearly uh, most consumers are good actors because you know, there is rampant uh, ACH fraud in this country, but, but relative to the overall volume of ACH transactions, it's still manageable. Uh, but um, with Zelle, for example, you don't have chargeback rights. And the way the banks deal with that is they basically make the limits very low. Anyway, so super interesting. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot more from the team on the payments front, getting uh, money into the system, super easy way, especially with the new trading features coming out is, is going to be right. a killer yeah. for us. Very and, exciting. Yeah. We've always had the best wire feature, I think, in the market. I think we're the only company that has global unlimited wires uh, still to this day. We've had it for a couple of years now, right? So I don't know anybody who's even close to that. Somebody asking about rates. I see, I see a couple of questions. I saw one question earlier um, when I first logged in about, do I see rates changing? We don't really change rates very often. And we, and, and we do that on purpose. We try to keep things very stable so that you're not having to look over your shoulder. Now, if, if there's dramatic, or, or not dramatic, but if there's you know, above reasonable changes to the, to the norm uh, where we're not having to subsidize rates, that may force us to, um, you know, to lower or, or, or raise if, 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 if warranted. Uh, and we have raised rates significantly on Tether, for example, uh, because the demand uh, for Tether on the bar side is incredibly high right now. So that's something that, you know, we, we look at multiple times a week, but we're reluctant to pull the trigger on any changes unless it really, really is necessary. And, and a few times a year, it's necessary and we do it. Uh, I, I do think we're going to see some changes in rates, most likely uh, on dollar rates to the downside in, in four to six months. So I don't think you're going to see much change in the short term, but I, who knows? It's just, it's just me reading tea leaves. Somebody's asking if we could add more cryptocurrencies as collateral for borrowing. That's actually a really good question. All right. So let me, this is not really a product question. It's more of a business question. So let me, let me address this. The product can support whatever we tell it to, to support for, for collateral for loans. I mean, I could take HBAR or XRP or LTC. The reason we don't do that is very simple. It's liquidity and spreads. When 
if you have a loan at a 50% LTV and you use a less liquid crypto for collateral and you are forced to be liquidated, you're going to get screwed twice, right? Once because your collateral is being sold, but that's the risk you took up front. But then you're going to get screwed again for the trading spread because you're dealing with a less liquid cryptocurrency. And then you're going to blame us for that as opposed to the market. And, and, and so it, we don't have a, a, a very simple way of making this clear to the average borrower right now. Not only is it not making it clear, I just don't think it's it's responsible to be using illiquid stuff as collateral. So for example, one of our competitors is actually taking NFTs as collateral for loans. Now, the concept I believe in, I think it's super interesting, but right now it makes no sense because one, you can easily manipulate the price or the floor price of an NFT, very easy. I can explain to you how to do it in 10 minutes, okay? And, and, and two, right, they're totally illiquid and the spreads between the buy and the sell price are enormous. So how are you valuing the collateral? It makes no sense. Now, do I think that this has a bright future? Absolutely, right? But I think there's also gonna be systems that are much harder to manipulate when you're dealing with certain types of gaming, uh, art and other NFTs in the future uh, when it's not just 20,000 people, which is what the NFT space today is. I'm super bullish on it. We're launching an NFT service, but let's talk about where we are today. It's very early. The vast majority of NFT transactions are the same 20,000 people, right? Now, I think it's going to be a million people in a year, but that's not where we are today. Anyway, all right, sorry for the rant. I know I'm answering a question that wasn't even asked. Look at that. Okay, so in... Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Gents, I'm really interested in the savings on Abra and the programs offered. Could you go over those? I'm a 401k IRA type saver. Uh, thanks, Timothy. Good question. Uh, Deepak, do you want to uh, take that? I'm curious, Tanner, what other questions you might see in that sp in that kind of realm or space. Uh, Deepak, why don't you go first? Yeah, so uh, retirement accounts are very interesting to us. We've been uh, talking to, in fact, actively with a bunch of uh, partners, uh, and there might be potential partnerships there, but the demand is clearly there, um, especially those who are long crypto. Uh, you know, we get it from our personal clients, our private clients, um, and uh, we think it's a great idea. Uh, there are a bunch of things that need to be sorted out on the logistics side and the op side. Um, the product dev piece uh, is is you know, relatively straightforward, I would say, but it's the it's the it's it's the entire support system that needs to build, you know, to to, to be built up. To support these retirement accounts within Abra, that's a, a, a bunch of work there. And we need to make sure that we're working with the right partners. We have the right model from a compliance perspective, from a tax perspective, um, and so on. So uh, in short, we are looking at it. It's very interesting. There's clearly there's demand. Um, and, uh, you know, at some point we'll have uh, a more, maybe, you know, more concrete news to share with you guys. Uh, but for now, we're looking at it actively. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I am not going to get into this in detail today, but I did say it on Frank's show, The Scoop, uh, that I mentioned earlier. I don't know if you guys were on when I, when I talked about it, but, but uh, I did uh, it, it publicly admit for the first time that Abra is going to become a bank, a full real bank, and, and, and not just a trust or not a money transmitter, but an actual bank. And so uh, I'm, I'm not, and, and that is US based, and I believe we would be the first to do that. I'm not going to get into details about jurisdiction, timing. But it's something we've been working on for literally over almost a couple of years now, and it's 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 coming to pass very very soon. Uh, it's a huge undertaking for the Abra team. In addition to all this product stuff you've been asking about, and you know they've been unable to talk about it, and I'm not going to get into it any more than that. Except it has very significant implications on um, on Timothy's question, and I've been reluctant to talk about it because the right answer to the question has to do with our future regulatory status, which I was loath to, uh, reluctant to get into. Uh, but since um, Frank got it out of me um, without any detail, I'll, I'll just throw that out there now and say we'll have a lot more to say about it uh, in in around the time of our new trading solution coming out. And uh, super excited about that. Okay, a couple of other questions. I know uh, Rob's about to join us, so let me get those questions out quick. Uh, so um, Abra has not been adding many new coins lately, and... Um, there's a reason for that, and it's related to our trading upgrade. So why don't we talk about that for a minute? And I'm curious, um, 
Tanner, are we seeing a lot of requests for specific tokens right now that, that you're getting consistently, or is it just across the board or? Kind of across the board. I think it's uh, it's pretty pretty normal in our space to get requests for tokens that people are interested in. Um, yeah, we're we're definitely working on a lot uh, to to Bill's point and Deepak's point as well. Um, so, a, a little bit of a calm before the storm, should we say? But a, but a good storm uh, for for users in terms of flexibility and and I think what's coming down the pipe is going to be really exciting. Yep. So so there's there's some logic here. So why don't you dig into that a, a little bit, Deepak? Yeah, that's precisely right. Uh, what what Tanner just said is that. Um, we've been talking about it a bunch, um, but essentially for, for, for those who might not have tuned in before, uh, right now we are in the process of upgrading our trading infrastructure, which in essence was set up maybe two, three years ago. At this point, it is dated. Um, and so we reached a point uh, in scale um, that uh, that couldn't go on. Uh, for too long. So earlier this year, we started on a journey to migrate our entire trading infrastructure, literally upgrade it from the ground up. Uh, and that in that process, um, we had to relatively freeze everything, like no more adding assets, no more adding, you know, any kinds of um, uh, order types, advanced order types, any of those things, we sort of had to freeze it and essentially just focus on upgrading the infrastructure, which we believe will scale massively, uh, way, way more than where we are right now. And it, it just you know, seems to reason that you know, once the infrastructure has been upgraded, then I absolutely see a tsunami of a selection of assets coming in, because that's exactly what this infrastructure is supposed to do, is it's supposed to um, be able to add incremental assets as quickly as possible. So that's what we're looking forward to. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. I, I, I think there's like a whole bunch of things that you're going to see uh, that this is going to enable for us, not only in 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 trading, but but staking, uh, and even then on the DApp side, right? Starting with NFTs and and some of the DeFi stuff, we'll be adding into Earn, but also for other um, uh, other blockchains besides. Uh, so, so right now we're planning the upgrades in stages. I think international is, is planned for, um, I think it's mid, mid August and then there'll be yeah, the late, upgrades yeah, from there. Half. But I think, uh, just kind of a last point, cause I think Rob's going to join us in a second. One of the things I'm super excited about, and, and, you know, I've been talking about C5 versus DeFi is, is that I think we're in a position to yeah i think eventually you'll be able to use any DeFi service if you understand how to do that via a dap browser i think they're too complicated today i think metamask is is as i've said way too complicated for the average consumer and significant money's been lost there but i think in the short term we're in a position to curate certain DeFi opportunities and make them directly available just like we did for nfts at the end of the day uh, you know nft is not that different from DeFi in terms of what you're actually enabling from a user uh perspective oh and i see rob's here shaking his head up and down so he agrees with me all right all right guys so uh apologies for the short aa today but i want to get to i want to get to rob i'm really excited about this so we'll bring him on thanks uh deepak tanner if you guys want to stick you. around for any questions you're welcome to uh even if it's just to, to listen in uh, i'm super excited about this and so uh yeah let's welcome uh rob come on in rob hey bill thanks for having me hey how you doing how's your travel going uh, just got home a few seconds ago, so really excited oh, to jump straight into the program. All right, well, we'll we'll be we'll be easy on you then. Uh, so let me just set the context for this for all of you. I know you, uh, Rob. Just so you're aware, uh, obviously with everything going on in our world the last few weeks, and and you know you and I have gotten into a little bit on 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 Twitter, but uh, you know we've spent a fair amount of time talking about C5 versus DeFi, how C5 should be using DeFi. And I know you have strong opinions on this. Uh, and for everybody else, just to put this in context, uh, Rob Leshner is, is a co-founder of, of Compound. I think you're, uh, uh, you've started this with Jeff, uh, Jeff Hayes. Uh, you guys have raised a bunch of money, I think something like 30, 40 million. Um, obviously, Comp is, is, is listed on, on Abra, and um, you know, it's, it's, it's fairly popular here. And you guys are basically building, I think, one of the more interesting and have built one of the more interesting uh, DeFi projects. And I'll let you uh, give us some of the stats, uh, but maybe we can we can just kind of get right into it. How, how did you come to start Compound, by the way? Just curious. 
Yeah. So my background long before I started Compound is I started my career as an economist uh, forecasting interest rates. And so interest rates were always a passion of mine. Um, when you know, the Ethereum blockchain started gaining momentum in 2016, 2017. You know, I asked the question to myself and to my co-founder, Jeff, and, you know, starting to do research about what was possible. You know, the question was, well, what can we use smart contracts for um, that wasn't possible before them? And the first use case that came to mind was the ability to borrow crypto um, without a computer program on a blockchain managing that process. There's not always the incentive for someone to repay what they've borrowed. Um, as we're seeing, you know, um, very, you know, publicly with a lot of, um, you know, CFI lenders right now mm -hmm. and smart contracts can really, you know, be extremely good at allowing people to borrow and the independent objective open source computer program manages the risk and ensures yep. that both parties to a transaction yep. are safe and protected. And, you know, when we looked at this you know, new technology, we said, wow, this is really well suited for borrowing um, and for creating, you know, an interest rate between different counterparties. And so we set out to work to build Compound, which is, you know, one of the first DeFi protocols. Um, you know, the assets in Compound have ranged from, you know, $0 at launch up to $20 billion um, at its peak. And currently about $4 um, billion or so of assets are in Compound, earning interest and being borrowed. And, you know, what's really exciting about, you um, Compound as a DeFi protocol is that, you know, over the last five years, it's really transformed from an experiment to a battle tested market that's governed by its users. And this has been a very long journey. And today, you know, the Compound protocol has been operating successfully for years and all of the users and members of the ecosystem are actually able to see how it works and change the way that it works through a, um, transparent governance process. So, so let me interrupt you there, right? So let's let's leverage that as an away point for some of the things that that you've been very public uh, about in your, in your comments. So 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 clearly your opinion is is that a lot of what's happened in the past couple of months and and I think you're mostly right and I'll, I'll, we can get into the delta but but you, your your opinion is and and I want you to correct me and and be more specific has been that a lot of this contagion would have been completely avoided uh, if if this was a, a DeFi based economy, is that is that more or less how you would have have been or would have said it? Yeah, that's more or less how I would say it. So there's really two primary advantages to DeFi markets or products. You know, the first one is transparency. Um, everybody, whether it's the users, whether it's outside observers, whether it's you know an analyst sitting at home, anyone can see the health of the system and who the users are. Um, synonymously, you know, based on, you know, addresses, but they can see who the users are, what their balances are, what they're doing. You know, there's radical transparency in a way that, you know, no financial products and financial markets have like really ever operated. Um, it's, you know, in a lot of ways, I think, you know, um, a radical improvement on the way that financial markets function. Yeah. And the second is predictability. And this is, you know, really interesting. And this is, you know, derived from the fact that DeFi protocols are just open source computer code. But what that means in terms of predictability is that it does what it says it's going to do. Um, it does what the code says it's going to do. It's not really up to the whims of, you know, people. It's up to the computer code. Now, that computer code is changeable. You know, in some situations, you know, in some DeFi based systems, it's very easy to change the code. Mm -hmm. In some DeFi protocols like Compound, it's actually extremely hard to change the code. <laughs> um, and so, you know, whether it's easy to change the code or extremely hard to change the code, the code lays out what the market does, how it functions, what risks it takes, how it manages risks, um, and, you know, what you can expect as a user, whether you're earning interest or borrowing from it. Yeah. And the reason why I think both of these things are in a lot of ways the antidote to the failure of a lot of CFI lenders recently is that, you know, one, um, opacity was the root cause of a lot of these losses. So just like we saw in 2007 and 2008, when nobody knew what anyone else was doing, nobody actually knew, you know, that three hours capital was borrowing so much from so many different market participants sure. at the same time. Um, we saw this recently, you know, with a hedge fund called Archegos borrowing from all the different Wall Street banks. You know, if everyone had all the information, the problem never would have arisen. Yeah. So, um, so let, let's unpack that for a minute because I, I think I think these are really important points. Okay. So, so, so first, I think your point on three arrows is spot on. However, I also think that part of the issue there is they were lying. 
So, so, so you could ask people to make disclosures and you're also taking on you know, faith that the answers you're getting are correct. Uh, and, I, and I don't know if, if long-term capital management was lying, uh, but it turns out, and, and Raul was talking about this uh, a few weeks ago, another conversation we had where he mentioned that, you know, one weekend, basically he was away with a bunch of his fellow prime brokers and he discovered for the very first time that every single one of them was the largest counterparty to long-term capital management, came home on Monday and basically unwound his positions. And he said it was the luckiest weekend he ever had. So, so now, so you, there's not a lot you can do about lying in a centralized model to some degree. You can probe, you can push, you can ask for documents, you can get more people involved, and it gets harder and harder to coordinate a lie, I'm guessing. Um, but clearly there is fraud there. All right. So so right. now on the other hand, uh, there are certain firms like, like BlockFi has come out and publicly said, we don't use DeFi to generate yield. Okay. Now on the other hand, we've public, publicly come out and said, we do use DeFi to generate yield. He, here's where I think um, the challenge for me comes in, and I'd love your comment or your, your perspective on this. We have a team that does nothing but analyze DeFi strategies, um, look for entry, exit, all of the uh, risk parameters that go into it in terms of exit costs, spread, um, you know, spreads on, on, on tokens that are being used to make interest payments on these things to basically say, are we going to make money on this or under which conditions are we likely to lose money? And our research shows that the average consumer who isn't you know, anywhere close to our level of expertise has a really good chance to lose money on a lot of these uh, oppor I'm going to use opportunities for lack of a, a, a better word uh, when they're doing this themselves via MetaMask and other things, not to mention the security uh, issues of, of trying to understand how to do this yourself. So, so how, do you, how do you reconcile that versus the reality of all the benefits that you're talking about? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So you know, my view of the world is that, you know, DeFi is a phenomenal backbone for a financial market to operate. And, you know, the way that I think people are going to operate and interact with DeFi protocols, you know, 10 years from now, you know, is not going to be one necessarily in which, you know, every individual is self-custodying their own assets and interacting directly with smart contracts running on a blockchain. You know, the world that I envision is one in which, you know, DeFi is the backbone of really big, really important financial markets. And you have, you know, a range of different institutions interacting with these DeFi protocols, you know, yep. offering access on behalf of a million users at a time, as opposed to asking a million people to all simultaneously do transactions on a blockchain, interacting with the smart contract. Um, it's one of the ways we get around all of the scaling complexities that blockchains have, um, you know, the cost of it, you know, DeFi is a infrastructure. It's not necessarily something that everyone's going to directly interact with. And I think there's a massive opportunity for firms like Abra and, you know, other organizations to be the ones interacting with DeFi protocols. And the DeFi protocol enforces that, you know, all of the different market participants are, you know, doing things fairly and correctly. And, you know, you can have specialized firms, you know, doing a lot of the work on behalf of many users. And so, you know, I, I think those two concepts fit together extremely well. And, yep. you know, I think eventually, you know, 10, 20 years from now, you know, JP Morgan is going to be offering access, you know, to DeFi protocols, you know. One oh, I agree completely. I think they're going to be using it more than providing access, uh, meaning the access will be indirect. So, so I just brought up, a, I don't know, Mr. Wizard here, if you can show this for the audience, but I just brought up a slide that we used uh, for an investor update, and I'm going to show it to, to all of you in raw form. This is so. So we have uh, a whole set of we have a risk team on DeFi, and we have a risk team on CFI, uh, and and slides look very different in terms of just some of the examples, right? So so on the DeFi side, we're talking about smart contract risk, meaning we'll go in and do code audits, which I'm guessing the average user doesn't do. Um, and, and well, I'm being facetious because the average user is not doing any of this. But but we look at governance risk in terms of you know how does the, the how do the token economic work uh, on chain governance all those things. Uh, we look at the economics of the system in terms of the incentives. Uh, what protocol is it? A, a new protocol token, right? Well, we should talk about Anchor for because uh, I know you have strong feelings about that. Uh, operational risk, right? Who's uh, on our side? Meaning because obviously it's all twenty four seven. Uh, but maybe there's different things about this protocol that represent different levels of operational risk. And then, as I mentioned before, entry exit costs, slippage, you know, basically things that, that might fall into things like trading risk. And, and so from your perspective, what, you know, when it comes to DeFi, what should the average investor be expected to be able to do, handle, grasp versus 
I, I realize that you guys are coming at this from a technology perspective, but you are also publicly railing against, you know, people using CFI. So, so how should the average user uh, look at these risks or any other risks and, and, and measure them versus how a company like Abra or, you know, one of these now defunct companies might have done it? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And, and it's also a really tough question. So, you know, my advice to anybody out there is to understand, you know, how a system works, you know, not in extreme technical detail, but just understand, you know, the basic building blocks of like what a system is doing and how it works before using it. So, you know, for Compound as an example of one DeFi protocol, you know, you, you should be able to understand, you know, where does the interest that borrowers are paying come from? You know, what risks, yeah. you know, are you taking if you are supplying liquidity to Compound to earn interest? Um, you know, what are the sort of like basic requirements around borrowers on the platform? You know, how are they liquidated um, yeah. if they're unable to repay what they've borrowed and, you know, have a basic understanding of what the system is and how it works. You know, for a protocol like Uniswap, it's a lot simpler. You just have to understand that, you know, you can input a trade and get an output. But if you're going to interact with something like Uniswap as a liquidity provider, you might want to understand the real basics of, you know, how the ratio of tokens in a liquidity pool changes mm -hmm. and, you know, how your returns you know, are not as simple as you might think they are. And yeah. so I think any user should have like a basic understanding of, you know, the economics of the tool they want to use um, yeah. before engaging with it. Totally agree. And, and uh, you know, the other thing, and I don't want to harp on this too much because, you know, this technology is so new that it's not, it's partially academic for me because it's just the reality of where the space is. But, you know, DeFi suffers losses. And, and so let's break it up. I'd, I'd love to get your perspective on anchor because i'm guessing you don't consider anchor DeFi, uh but but most users who lost money might have and so i would love to hear your perspective on that how the average user should should come to terms with what is DeFi and what's not DeFi, right because d seems to be a spectrum <laughs> yeah absolutely so the d in DeFi stands for decentralized and yes there's absolutely a spectrum um, DeFi is an umbrella term gets used very loosely, um, yep. from things that just, you know, in general, anything that is, you know, managing assets on a blockchain gets the moniker DeFi, whether it's correct or incorrect. Um, you know, Anchor was somewhere in the middle in that it was using, you know, contracts running on a blockchain to manage yep. this process of paying an interest rate out, um, the flaw in Anchor in a lot of ways was that the system itself was unsustainable. You know, when you looked at what Anchor was, you know, Anchor was a protocol similar to Compound where people could borrow assets from Anchor and pay an interest rate. And on the other side of that, people can earn an interest rate by supplying liquidity to Anchor. Well, you know, in Anchor, um, unlike a system like Compound, the amount of interest being paid by borrowers was not equal to the amount of interest being earned by suppliers of assets. Um, in fact, you know, there was a massive shortfall and that shortfall was being made up for by, you know, the sponsors of that protocol, just pumping money into it to be able to continue paying, you know, a high interest rate. Sure. Um, that's not a sustainable economic system. And a lot of people, when they looked at Anchor, you know, there's a lot of people screaming on Twitter for months and years before, it, you know, it blew up, but screaming, hey, this is not sustainable. This doesn't work. Um, something has to go, something has to give, right? And you know, in terms of its level of decentralization, I mean, there was a central team that was, you know, in complete control of the entire system. Um, so it wasn't really that decentralized, but no one really wanted it to be decentralized. They just wanted the interest they wanted rate the to parts. stay at, yeah, right. they just wanted 18 to 20% interest yeah. and for it to continue in perpetuity for years and years and years. Yeah, you know, so so I, that's right, 100%. And, and so I have friends that are Abra customers who were also basically putting millions of dollars in anchor and I'm telling, I'm explaining to them, you're treating this like a bank account and, and you know, you should, okay. I have all my liquid assets in Abra, but I still mentally understand, you know, how we generate the yield. I talk about it all the time. Um, and, and we actively manage against risk in CFI and DeFi. And, and there's no way any of you who are referring to this as a bank account are in a position to understand any of these risks and neither is any regulator overseeing it, which is what you would normally have when you use the term bank. Um, anyway, so let, let's talk about that in relation to Compound. 
right? So, so you said the D is a spectrum. Where, where what, what is the definition of a truly decentralized DeFi system, and and where is Compound on that spectrum? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I would say Compound is. 90% um, to the extremely hardcore conservative decentralized end of the spectrum. So the most hardcore, you know, decentralized tools are things like Bitcoin. So Bitcoin, it's extremely hard to change the rules of Bitcoin. You have to get, you know, the majority of miners to agree with a change. And they're not going to do that unless everyone agrees that a change to Bitcoin is the right change. It's extremely decentralized and very hard yep. to modify. Um, a little bit, you know, below Bitcoin are, you know, Ethereum protocols like Uniswap. Uniswap, the code of it can't change, um, and can't change is almost as good as extremely hard to change. It might, not, it might be better in a lot of ways. Um, the core code of Uniswap is completely immutable. You know, there can be new versions of it that you know users might migrate to, but the version of Uniswap that anyone's using can't change like at all. And so the way it works today, it'll work tomorrow. Yeah, because it's interesting that you went to the code change first, because I often think about this in terms of the on and off switch, right? And 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 to me, that's probably more fundamental even than I'm, I'm thinking about it before I say it, but but I'm going to go there anyway and say more fundamental than the ability to easily or not easily change the code. Meaning, if somebody put a gun to Rob's head and said, shut off compound right now to the public, could you do it? No. Um, but the reason why I talk about the code change is it doesn't yeah. matter if there's an on and off switch, if the code can change eventually, there could be an on or off switch. Right? Okay. So, all right. So same gun is right here to your head and, and sorry, for, <laughs> sorry, I don't want to make, you know, rough or rough. Uh, but, but I, now the, instead of saying, shut it off, make the following changes right now. Could you do it? No. Um, and th so I'll, I'll describe how compounds governance works for anyone who, you know, um, hasn't gone deep into, um, the mechanics of it yet. So compound is, you know, an extremely, um, hardcore, um, governance process. And the way it works is all changes to the protocol are voted on on chain. There's no off chain components to it. And what the participants are voting on are modification to the code base of compound. It's not like a text-based proposal saying, hey, we hope that some foundation goes out and does this thing. Uh, the work has to be done upfront and you're basically voting on whether or not to implement new code. It's actually very similar to the way that Bitcoin might fork, whether it's a soft fork or a hard fork. Um, you're voting on changes to the system. Yep. It's not like, you know, how some, you know, decentralized organizations work where it's like, hey, there's a vote to, you know, spin up a new website and change the logo color. But are those votes guidance or once the vote is yes, a, a, a switch is automatically flipped somehow and that code is live? Yeah, it, after a waiting period um, for safety, it's automatically live. Um, so, you know, people are voting on, you know, new parameters and new code of the protocol itself. And there's a review process before things go to a vote, then there's a voting process, and then there's a waiting period before they go live. And all along the way, if you know you disagree with the change to the code, you can leave. You can, yep. you know, repay anything you've borrowed and you can withdraw your assets and nobody can stop you. And it's designed so that um, it doesn't require any middlemen. So, you know, if you know, you put a gun to my head, I would have no special powers over, you know, Bill or over any other participant in the ecosystem. And, you know, I'm not required for there to be any changes. You know, if all of Compound Labs, which originally built the protocol, you know, went on permanent vacation, it wouldn't matter. Nobody yeah. would notice even. Um, the protocol would continue to run. So the, and the third, community could keep upgrading it. Yeah. The third aspect of this, though, I think, if I get this right, is how decentralized is the holder base that is actually making these governance choices, right? So meaning 100 million people deciding on the future release of this code base versus 50, uh, to me, points to an, an, an extreme difference in, in, in decentralization because I need a lot, a lot fewer of those guns that I, that I talked about earlier uh, in one case versus the other. And, and, and so how do you feel about that versus where we are and what's therefore decentralized and what's not? Yeah, that's a great question. So I give Compound, you know, a B minus um, for like the distribution of stakeholders. So, okay. you know, Bitcoin is a great example where like, wow, there's a lot of nodes <laughs> and, 
you know, there's a lot of hash power and it's extremely decentralized. Um, you know, the hash power is obviously concentrated into some like really large mining um, businesses, but, you know, it's really distributed. Um, yeah. Compound's less distributed. So, you know, there's, if you look at, you know, the distribution of tokens, there's- I got it here, by the way. I'm looking at Etherscan. And I see, I bring, I'll bring it up on the screen for you. I think I, um, if I have this wrong, please tell me I'm to turn it off. But, but basically if I go to your Etherscan link, I see like 32% is, is currently controlled by Compound. And then there's like 50 other, um, uh, 50 other uh, that more or less control like half the network. Does that that's sound? A, that's, yeah, it's actually incorrect. So the first- yeah address there, the reservoir, that's yeah. the supply of tokens that gets distributed to users over time. So that's not even- control that. That's in the protocol, it's the contracts itself. Exactly. And the second line is actually tokens that users are supplying to the protocol as collateral. So gotcha. those are not voting at all. Gotcha, gotcha, um, gotcha. The best place to see like the actual sort of distribution is, yeah, th there's this page, but it's not as descriptive. Yeah. Any token holder can participate in the governance process. And so- you know, anyone can take tokens off of Binance 8, you know, which is the, you know, number three holder mm -hmm. and take them and vote with them inside the protocol. Yeah. You know, it's possible that that Binance address that you were showing has 50,000 users who, sure. if there's a contentious vote that they care about, might take their tokens off of the exchange and vote with them. I see. Um, so, you know, the reason I give Compound a B minus is that, you know, it's, a very distributed group of token holders. A lot of the participants in the governance process are very professional. They spend a lot of time like thinking about votes and participation. And, you know, the reason why it's not like an A plus is that the tokens that are being distributed to users. And yeah. over time, there's going to be more and more and more small holders who are the users of the protocol and less of the original backers and venture funds and, you know, folks that have a yeah. large stake. And so- yeah. You know, the distribution's improving over time. There's still a couple of years of distributing tokens to users remaining. And at the end of that, I think we'll probably have a B plus or an A minus um, in terms of how many participants there are, but it's only steadily improving. Yeah, gotcha. So so my last two questions, right? Kind of interrelated, right? Well, I have one question uh, back to school. Remember that uh, I have one question in 85 parts. No, I actually have uh, two, two questions and they're kind of this part and parcel of the same question. Like where... How do you think consumers, individual investors, should think about DeFi today versus five years from now and, and where it fits in if they're into crypto? And how do you think uh, other CeFi companies like Abra or even banks should be thinking about DeFi now versus five years from now? Well, my answer is actually the same, both for individuals and for okay. institutions. Okay. So I think it's you know important to think about DeFi as a very similar, you know, profound shift in the way society works on par with the internet, but also equally early in its life. So in a lot of ways, I think DeFi is like the internet in 1997, where there was a couple great applications. You know, the web was kind of small. All of it was extremely early. There was a lot of wrinkles in the technology. There was a lot of problems with it. You know, a lot of people said like, oh, the internet's never going to amount to anything. It's just for, you know, offshore gambling and pornography and, exactly. you know, chat rooms. That's like, that's not a good technology. DeFi today is a lot like that. It's, you know, a glimmer of an incredible transformation in the way that finance operates. It's still early. There's only a couple like really incredible applications, um, but you know, almost all of the growth of the technology and its adoption is going to be coming over the next 15 years. We're only a couple years into DeFi, sure. and you know, I view this as like really important to understand is that this is like the beginning. This is not the end. You know, what DeFi is in 10 years is not at all what it is today. Yep. You know, it's going to be running you know, faster, cheaper, more global in scale. It's going to, you know, everything about it's going to be improved. And so whether you're an individual or an institution, now is the best time to learn because the technology is going to evolve a lot. And, you know, it's possible that some of the applications today are going to be the killer applications still in 10 years, you know, the Amazons of 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. But most of the things that I think are going to work in DeFi haven't been created yet. Um, Interesting. And, you know, it's still incredibly early. Yeah.
Yeah. So, so I'll give you, I'll give you my take on, on the evolution. Cause I, I'm curious. Please. To, yeah. It's a free consulting. Maybe you tell me if I got it wrong. So, so I think I, I look at it as three kind of big milestones. Well, independent of the evolution of the protocols themselves, where I'd say that's kind of like, you know, day zero, right. Which is just started, right. We've had the big bang of the idea. And now it's like, it's the, the, the universe is expanding kind of milestone one beyond that is CFI companies able to take advantage of the protocols because they can dig in on risk and make the case that they're going to expose to users what they're doing. Uh, and you can see it on chain because most users can't really, uh, per our discussion, truly understand the nuances and, and complexities of rating, you know, your quality of what you're doing, which is incredible versus a lot of other MIT projects developed on a weekend where people don't understand the difference, right? That's one. And, and I think that will evolve. And I don't know if you heard my comment earlier that we have publicly said for the first time that we are becoming a full bank. And the irony of that is not lost on me, right? Versus what you're trying to build, because there's a third milestone and a second, a second and a third milestone. The second is, I think, uh, crypto native companies will then start to use DeFi protocols the way I'm describing, but as banks, as opposed to something else. And this whole unbanked bu self bullshit is, is going to, you know, be completely gone. But the third and, and kind of, well, actually there's a third or fourth. The third is traditional banks will do it as well to your point about Chase and others. And, and that may take 15 years. I don't know. And, and that's not a really long time when I think about it in terms of my internet years, because it's been 25 years since I was at Netscape. And, and the fourth is, is that there are going to be banks which are actually DAOs that, that would do what Chase would do using DeFi, but physically have no off switch. And I don't know how we get there. Um, and I don't think anybody does yet, but it seems like that's what needs to happen because then in theory, you can eliminate all of the contagion associated with um, people and, and, and banks. But I don't see ways to skip the steps. And I'm curious if if you think that some of those steps might be skipped or am I missing what you know, how how might you see that? Yeah, I, I think you're right, right? And I think, you know, all of that's going to occur. And it's almost impossible to predict how it's going to unfold and when it's going to unfold. And, you know, someone might, you know, create something entirely new next week that catches everybody off guard, that creates a decentralized bank with, you know, fiat rails, as well as, you know, crypto backend, like, it, it's hard to say, I'm just really excited about all the things that people are building. Um, and just trying as an individual to stay on top of the developments in our industry, because, you know, it's accelerating, the speed of innovation is going up, not down. Yep. Awesome. Rob, I could talk to you all day. Uh, we're at 10 after already. So people are thanking us. We're getting a lot of thanks here. Super interesting. Just reading the comments. Um, you know, a bunch of other questions we've already answered. Incredible uh, interview. Really enjoying you and Rob. So, so really great comments here. Uh, we'll have it up. Uh, this is live. So people are seeing this right now on YouTube, Facebook, but we'll have it up on the, the podcasts later today. So thank you, Rob. I know you're traveling today. You did this in a big hurry and uh, it was awesome. Really super. One of my favorites that we've done uh, to date. So thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Really enjoyed the conversation and thanks for having me, Bill. Absolutely, man. Well, we'll see you soon. Cool. Thank you. All right, gang. So uh, thanks, Rob. Thanks, Deepak. Thanks, Tanner. Thanks, uh, show producers, Abra marketing team, as always. Uh, fantastic. Um, and uh, there are some other questions lingering here. Uh, and I'm happy to take a couple more of them, even though we're over. So feel free uh, to leave us if you've got other stuff to do. Uh, just consider this over time. Let's see. Um, I'll work backwards here. So uh, no, we have no relationship whatsoever with any of the defunct companies in the CFI lending space, Celsius, Voyager, uh, uh, BlockFi is actually looks like they're going to make it, but we have no relationship directly or indirectly with any of those companies and, uh, never have, never will. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, a couple of questions for Rob that I missed. Sorry about that gang. Um, hopefully we'll get them back on again. And, uh, somebody was asking if the majority of the votes in, in, um, uh, in compound can become centralized. And I guess, um, uh, Big tech son, your question. I guess if 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 somebody tries to buy all of the compound, then they would control the governance, uh, but that would also drive the price up, which would make it harder. So there's some incentives there to maintain decentralization, and we'll see how these systems work over time. But um, yeah, so I think 
Uh, thank you for discussing risk. This is my number one issue with DeFi. We need to do our own research in crypto, um, uh, but the info to, to make investing choices is usually unavailable or opaque. I agree with that. And that's why I think it's important for companies like Abra to uh, be trailblazers in this space, but recognize that because it's other people's money, we have tremendous responsibility. So DeFi has been you know, anywhere from 5 to 15% of our invest investments in um, you know, generating yield. And it, it, it may grow over time. I think it will grow over time, but it's been very slow, very methodical, very complicated. And uh, that just points, I think, to this issue that consumers need to be aware of that, you know, this is not easy stuff. Yes, it's opaque, but it's also opaque to the extent that you understand uh, all of the technology and how to do it. Okay. All right. I'll stop there. It's 10 after. And Again, uh, express my, my gratitude to all of you, as always. Uh, we've got a, a wide audience. Hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, whatever platform you're on, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitch. Uh, we've got folks on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. So, so I think we, we've got to have at least you know, 30 to 50,000 listeners a week just across all of those different platforms. Uh, Twitter, I think I don't know if I mentioned Twitter is another one. So, so yeah, uh, spread the word. Um, we do this to help educate all of you. We don't make money on this. We have no uh, sponsors. Uh, we do it because we want to be stewards of the community, and we love the feedback. So let us know other guests you'd like to see. Of course, we're going to have Ralph Paul from Real Vision on next week. Super excited about that. And yeah, in the meantime, have a great weekend. Thanks, uh, Tanner, Deepak, Abra team. We will see you next week on Money Talks.